Welcome everybody uh, to another uh, lesson with the one and only Nicola Station. Uh, Nicola, it's a pleasure to be back at it and uh, to be helping you out once again. I'm, I'm so glad that we're we're doing this. You played the adoption match against Anna, but you have more matches on the horizon and we're going to have more sessions. How are you feeling on this evening? Uh, what's coming up for you? First, uh, a huge thank you, Dania, for this. That's very, very, very greatly appreciated. And hold on, my desktop audio is here. All of a sudden decided to do, do, go quiet on me. So just bear with me while I fix that. Uh, so huge shout out to Dania. Thank you, guys. Thank you for accepting to do this. Yes, I lost my match against Dana Muzichuk, but uh, very frankly, it was very, very useful, and uh, uh, I learned a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I watched some of the games. It was definitely very close. I'm just adjusting my cam here, no. uh, and uh, I definitely think you know a lot of improvement is on the horizon, and I'm Thank honored you, to be helping you out. All right, so I'm just trying to center my cam okay so uh just a quick summary of, of what the sort of agenda is today and we'll see where the stakes is as usual um i'm fine to do detours or tang go on tangents as necessary that's i think a good thing uh so uh first of all our main topic of discussion uh was actually the notion of resilience and the notion of surviving uh bad positions uh even lost positions how do you plan lost positions um and i have a couple of thoughts on that topic, which I think is largely neglected by, you know, by just literature and instructional content, because the presupposition, Nicola, is that you're not supposed to get any lost position. So why even talk about <laughs> what to do when you get them? Because that means you've already done something wrong. And if you read the book uh, that you're reading, then you'll never do anything wrong. Uh, so I think it, it sort of falls uh, beneath the cracks. And uh, there's one other opening line, if we have time, that uh, we're going to take a look at in the fried liver. I think that might present a nice balance. Uh, what do you feel about that? I, I, f I love the idea as, uh, as I mentioned in our prep, I actually, after 14 adoption matches, I am having a 15 match on su this Sunday at noon. That's actually different from the rest. I am actually trying to do the adoption myself. I think <laughs> I might have bit more than I could chew. I'm trying to adopt WIM Jesse February from hashtag chess. So, uh, you know, so in other words, the strategy is completely different now. So Daniel mm -hmm. was kind enough to, to assist. And Daniel and I are trying to make this uh, a regular feature because I think we both enjoy working with each other, so. Absolutely. And uh, we'll begin uh, as is our tradition with one warm up problem. Um, okay. I've chosen something a little bit different. It's less about calculation here and more about uh, tactical logic and surviving chaotic positions, which is another a topic, Nicola, that you mentioned you wanted a little bit of work on. You got a okay. bit of a chaotic, crazy tactical position. What are some of the logical processes that you could undertake uh, to make heads or tails? Of it? So I'm going to just paste the position in just a moment here. Thank and you. uh, as you're thinking, I'm just going to grab my coffee as well. And then we will fire things off. Okay. Let me know if you see the position. Yes, I see the position. So okay. it is white to move. This is from a game between two Russian grandmasters. And I will deliberately sort of not tell you the evaluation or whether you're aiming for, you know, win or, you know, a draw, whatever it is. Uh, try to determine that on your own and uh, try to generate the best move here and the idea of this move. And I'm just going to grab my coffee and be back in 10 seconds. Oh, yeah, of course. Okay. Uh, hi guys, hi Dirk. Uh, yes, I played 14 adoption matches uh, until until now, and the one on Sunday will be 15th. And I pre uh, white is to move in this position, I'm presuming. So uh, here is uh, here is uh, my my right or, or thought. Um, I'm hearing hearing what you're saying, by the way. So continue. Okay, thanks, Daniel. So here is a here is a very quick overview of my thought. First is if you want a survey of the position. Survey of the position tells us that uh, uh, white is a rook down, um, and he has actually two pawns for the rook, uh, which really is obviously insufficient compensation. On the other right. hand, it has so basically we need to. Um, have some sort of a, a significant mating attack to compensate for that. 
Mm -hmm. uh, the question here is, you know, so in other words, it's not like we can exchange all pieces and win the end game here. So that's the survey of the position I have next. I'm usually, since I, this is presumably a long game, it's not a blitz. I'm looking at candidate moves first, starting mm -hmm. with checks. Uh, I have one check here. Actually, I have two checks. Uh, I have check on f7 with a queen, which is right. looks like a candidate move, as a matter of fact. And then there is a check on f8, which is not a candidate move. Uh, right. I don't see any captures that would be meaningful. I can capture a defended, couple of defended pawns with, uh, with a queen, and I don't have any other captures. And then looking at threats, I don't, um, you know, I don't see any way to gen, uh, at least not yet, to generate a threat that would be winning. Right, okay. right. Good, good assessment so far. Okay. Um, now you mentioned the one check that that you sort of the move that you see first when you look at this position, which is yes. what? Yes, it's. Uh, King, uh, queen f7 is a, is a very natural move because black king has only one position. Right. We then actually have a follow-up potential check on c6. Okay, right. potentially knight c6. Potentially knight c6. Uh, I think the issue with that check is that um, we cannot... Uh, and there is another potential check, which is to follow up with a queen f8. Right. So let's indicate that in blue, the yes. potential checks after king d8. Okay. There's two of them. So knight c6 actually makes sense because you're trying to distract the black knight from its defense of the g8 rook. But there is a problem, which is what? After knight c6. The problem is that, uh, you know, black can capture with the rook. Right. And he's still going to be a piece up. It seems like the attack fizzles out. What about queen f8 check? Uh, queen f8 is, uh, it looks like a more appealing move, at least yeah. initially. Uh, the question here is, what is a response? Obviously, if uh, white, if black takes on mm -hmm. uh, f8, we're going to take and promote to a queen, and then we, we are actually not doing that badly. Right. And that's actually something that's important to realize, is sort of benchmarks, right? Uh, yes. it's easy to get bogged down in the resulting position when we make the moves on the board and say, well, how do I evaluate this? It's very clear that white has won the rook back. He's up upon, he has the attack. It doesn't even really matter if he's winning or just better. It's clear that we have done our job. And so that can save us a lot of time. Yeah. Now, what is the issue going back to the starting position so you can practice some visualization yeah. after queen F8 check, what does black do? Uh, black doesn't need to take on f8 and can play, right. uh, can play queen c uh, king c7. Correct. And then we need to find the counter to that. Right. And that's obviously the problem of the whole line. Right. The king is out in the open. It's free, and white white's attack runs out of gas. Yes. Um, and this is exactly why sort of I'm giving you this particular problem because it shows a facet of calculation that a lot of people just aren't aware of and don't incorporate in their own calculations is that uh, it, it, people treat calculation as this sort of one or zero phenomenon. Either an idea works or it doesn't work and we need to move on to the next idea. But yeah. what you need to realize is that sometimes an idea can be broken down and we can literally treat an idea uh, as if we're a doctor figuring out what's wrong with a patient. What's wrong with the idea? What would make this idea work? Um, what would eradicate the sort of disease? What would eradicate the defensive idea that my opponent has? And by literally applying that kind of logic, yeah. we can actually make an idea work that otherwise fails for a particular reason. So that's kind of the hint I'm going to give you. Now you actually have to perform that duty in this position. Yeah. And I, I actually, and I think this is exactly why you gave me this position, because this is the type of position in which brute force doesn't work. Exactly. So here is a one that I'm seeing one possible counter as a move number one, because right now, interestingly enough, it's the question of how black can improve his position is an interesting question. Um, because if he moves the knight, for example, say it plays knight d5, then queen f7, there is, you know, th then that 
rook on g8 is undefended. And right. And we can play queen f7 and, uh, you know, we're going to collect the rook and we're doing great. Yeah, we collect everything and that pawn's going to promote. It's going to be a disaster. Queen needs to sit tight where it is, or at least I'm not seeing anything that immediately proves Queen's position. Mm -hmm. Which basically leaves us with one preparatory move that Weiss should make Inca. in this position, which is Rook A1. So that is almost correct. You have the right idea and slightly the wrong executioner. Here's the problem. Okay. It looks like a very powerful preparatory move, but in fact, there is a ticking clock here in the form of a pass pawn. Ah, and okay. let's trace how the move rook a1 impacts the uh, efficacy of the main idea that we are trying to prepare. Well, you can do all of this, and it looks like uh, white actually may have done something good here because what extra move now exists? A rook a7. Right. But you're making a lot of noise. The problem is now the king escapes. Black is threatening to promote. He's attacking the rook. There is simply no, no follow-up here. Time. Yep. So... Uh, the reality is you are thinking in the right direction, you're trying to prepare queen f7, queen f8, but you need something that somehow limits black in a more direct manner than, than move rook a1. And, okay. and this move is hard to see. I mean, it's a very, very elegant idea, I think. But okay. keep searching. Okay, fair enough. Um, so let me, let me, let, so rook a1 is not, a, it's obviously doesn't work as a candidate move. Um, all right, so. Okay, so there is the, there is another way to block the black's escape to c7, which is basically mm -hmm. what's holding us, and that's to play b6. Okay. So that's another potential candidate move. Okay. So b6. Okay. And the idea is you're controlling c7. Yes. And the obvious next step is well, what move has to be considered? After Obviously, d2 is it's still a threat. Well, let's say d2 happens. Can we flesh that line out? Okay. So we plan queen f7, king d8, rook f8, and now black actually has to take. Yep. And we do what? And then we deliver it a checkmate. Yes, by promoting. We can actually promote to a rook if we're feeling trolly. Now, after b6, though, there is one move that then immediately has to be tested, which is what? Which is take on a b6. Takes on b6. And we have to understand how that impacts the position. Clearly, Black's defenses are so fragile that it makes sense that moving one piece out somehow impacts negatively his construction. But what specifically happens? Let's uh, continue the calculation after queen takes yeah, b6. The, the knight on e7 is no longer defended. Exactly. And how does white exploit that? We Make can so follow content. the same line and play rook f8. And after king c7, we can take the, take the, we're going to take go. the knight. And after king b8, we're going to play uh, knight b7 and Excellent. collect the queen. Fantastic calculation. That's exactly right. And after b6, black simply resign the game because he's going to have to choose between giving up like the queen or getting checkmated just to show this all on the board. The move b6 deprives the king of this crucial escape square. So just for full effect, I'm going to make a rook here. This is checkmate. Um, you can see what, what I occupy my time with. And so literally the move uh, queen takes b6 is forced. I mean, black can take here. But that nearly staves off defeat. Now white is threatening the same thing, basically. Uh, so taking is forced. Now we give a check. Notice that the queen no longer defends the knight. Check, as you indicated correctly. Yep. Check on e7, taking the knight. And it's actually very important to see knight e7. Otherwise, black is still up in exchange and the position remains very unclear. Yeah. But with knight e7, white wins the queen. Yeah. Um, so the lesson from this, well, there's a couple of things to, to note here. Obviously, the first being sometimes the correct move wears the kind of clothing that you might not uh, suspect. And that's partly why I think uh, it's the method of only looking for forcing moves can be overrated. But the main thing is that you can take an idea that doesn't work and literally try to understand why it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have more time than you think you do. A lot of people would throw this out entirely because they think they're down a rook and they have to be in a hurry. But as you correctly indicated and noticed, white actually does have one or two tempi for preparation. Those are the sort of uh, takeaways, I would say, from this one-off problem. Okay. Does that sort of make sense? 
No, thank you, Daniel. This this was actually an interesting problem. It's uh, fantastic. Yeah, I'm glad you enjoyed it. And let's let's jump into to the the sort of meat. And uh, to begin, the way that we're going to do this, I'm going to show a couple of segments from uh, from my games, probably because we sort of put put an emphasis on analyzing very thoroughly. Uh, we're only going to have time for one or two, but um, we're going to talk by and large about uh, not just slightly worse positions, but actually, you know, much worse slash lost positions. Uh, how do you generate realistic chances? And when most people hear that, all they think about is, is traps. You know, I'm going to set a couple traps, and my opponent's going to fall into them. But but good opponents are expecting you to set traps when you're in a lost position. That's exactly what they want you to do. So. Uh, you know, somebody who's experienced is not going to be brought down with a cheap trap that upon failing forces you to resign. That's not going to be the thrust of the advice that I share, as you can probably guess. And let us begin now with the following game segment. I'm going to paste in a position from my game against, I don't know if you've heard of Grandmaster Joshua Friedel. He also yes, streams. He also streams, yes. Good friend of mine. He lived in the Bay Area for a while and yeah. I've known him for many years. This game was played at the U.S. Championship 2014, um, second round, I was playing with the white pieces. And uh, it doesn't take long to see that white is in tremendous trouble. Can you sort of spell out exactly why that is? Okay. Um, all right. So the rough analysis of the position is uh, uh, white is a pawn down. Uh, the pawn on a3 is very well advanced. And yep. it's defended by b4 the you know there is danger of uh, something along the line and something on the line of rook c4 that's probably mm -hmm. too concrete the pawn no that's exactly d4, right yeah the pawn on d4 is potentially weak mm -hmm. and uh, you know the the white pieces are passive the one potential attempt to control the c file is is basically rook c5 but the bishop controls it in other words it's a pretty passive position for white and it's kind of you know I, actually this is always this is obviously a, uh, a class about counterplay and how to generate right. counterplay so it's this looks like to be a difficult way to yeah happen. and and black has a plan here which i spotted which i thought it was just going to bring me down within a couple books and you pointed out the first move of this bank. Let's just make a couple empty moves just to illustrate this. Okay. Rook c4, how does black follow this up? Just as a little bit of training and positional thinking. I mean, a very simple follow-up. Okay. The I mean, he, he can bring the other rook to yeah. rook c8. Uh, and this is going to come and just destroy me completely. I mean, hey, this is going to fall. And I just figured and d4 is weak. There's no way I'm going to survive this path six seven moves i could stave this off but realistically yeah. i thought if he gets his rooks doubled and he gets his rook to c2 even if he trades all of the rooks and puts his queen on c4 later on he can maneuver the bishop to b6 and pressure the pawn i know that this might not look completely losing but do you understand that i'm playing a very strong gm i know that he's going to see all of this and so i thought i have to do something right now i have literally my days are numbered i need i have like one move for two moves to generate counter yeah, And then I thought, counterplay, like, what the hell can we do here? He's, his position seems completely watertight. And that is sort of one of the hallmarks, I would say, of resilience, of, of being a resourceful player who's hard to bring down, is this ability to look past the superficial, uh, sort of, to look past the facade of the position and to detect hidden sources of counterplay, hidden weaknesses in your opponent's position. Uh, I think being able to do that and combining that with the ability to also change the course of the game, I think that's the appropriate expression, which is, okay, if the game has gone in a very positional direction, your opponent is outplaying you, you all of a sudden whip up chances against his king, and vice versa. If your opponent is attacking the hell out of you, then sometimes it's very effective, and look at examples of this, to just trade queens and force him to win an end game, even if this end game seems completely losing, and I will show you an example of this after this, actually. So... Here, it seems like the former might be the most uh, applicable option. Now, take a look at this position and see if you can find uh, a way to do what I just described. Okay. 
take as long as you need and no rush. Okay. Um, Feel free to walk me through a consideration, however you prefer to do it. Okay, so what Daniel said is nice, but it's not immediately obvious, which is, I guess, the point. Um, we have an advantage that we actually have the, the move. The problem here is that uh, black plan is fairly obvious. And I will venture to say that trying to, um, you know, we need to generate counterplay. And yes. Queen is already well positioned to generate that counterplay. Um, the thing here is how we're going to bring other pieces to bear. Mm -hmm. if we are, and the only chance we have is basically an attack on the Black King. Exactly. And yeah. how, like, what move are you going to have to eventually make by hook or by crook to, be, to create any kind of openings on the, black, on the King's side? Like, what are you going to have to do at some point? Well, I kind of need to put the queen on h6 at some point. And okay, but is that going to be enough? No, because, you know, queen, uh, queen itself cannot generate a mating. Correct. Attack. So, so you're going to have to create weaknesses of some sort or some sort of open files, and how will that happen? That can happen in only... I can either try to open the h file somehow, mm -hmm or I can try to bring the knight over. The problem with bringing the knight over is that I need, hold on, let me, I, I kind of need three moves to bring the king into the attack, or knight into the attack, mm -hmm. which might be too slow. Yes. Uh, and second, uh, any avenues approach to the black king are controlled by the bishop. Exactly. That's really the problem. Even if the knight, and I call this the worst case scenario test or the best case scenario test. Yeah. If you have an idea, you ask yourself, okay, let's say my opponent allows me to execute that idea. Even at the end of it, the bishop just takes the knight. So it's just not, not, uh, you know, feasible. Yeah. So we go back to the first thing you said, how exactly are we going to open up the file that you mentioned with what breakthrough? We can only one, exactly one pawn breakthrough in this position. And yes. G4. Right. Now, here's the important thing. Whether G4 is good, I don't give a crap. About. Like, no. <laughs> you just know that you have yeah. to do this, and you know that you have to prepare G4. But that leads to the question of how to prepare G4, because my resources are stretched so thin right now. It seems like every piece is holding the world on its shoulders, and so you cannot consign it to the task of preparing G4. But there is a catch. And this is, you know, a move that... In the end, I was proud of, even though it's not the computer's top choice, but I think this move was responsible by and large uh, for the, the course that the game took. What okay. do you do when all of your pieces are occupy, are doing a job? Yeah. It's like in soccer, when they're, during the last seconds, when you're kicking a corner and you must score a goal, who comes out? The goalkeeper. Goalkeeper. Yep. Yeah. Goalkeeper. In more than one come. sport. Indeed, including in chess. As you'll see. So what do we do? How do we prepare G4? Okay. If you're telling me that we're going to march the king to F6 and meet the black king, that's, uh, I'm in, very interested. Well, <laughs> how would you operationalize that? Okay. The first step is to prepare G4. We're not marching the king to F6 yet, but who said we can't use the king for that purpose? No, that's actually exactly, exactly right. Here is the thing. Um, we can't move that rook on c1 because rook c3 is going to get dead very quickly. Right. So candidate move rook h1 doesn't work. Right. And I, you know, after you gave the description, I'm pretty sure I know what you already, already know what you played. You okay. Played king h3. So basically right now, I played the other move to prepare G4, which is what? The same exact idea. Same exact. I, but, okay. but it's the same move, just a different iteration of it. Which move? King F3? Yes. And there's only one reason that I played it. Psychology. Uh, the reason for that is that uh, King on H3 blocks the H file. Well, I mean partially, but mostly it was psychology. It was the shock value. If you know that you're losing, <laughs> and it sounds like, oh, come on, and people are going to roll their eyes at this, but... When you see a move like King F3, it's almost like you get angry. You're like, man, 
I've got to be able to refute this really quickly. And so when you get that feeling in your mind of I got to refute this quickly, what happens is oftentimes you lose your objectivity, you rush and you get impatient. The reality is King F3 is not that easy to refute. Um, and uh, King H3 and King F3 essentially lead to the same results. But yeah, I also didn't want to block the H file in the event that a rook gets to H1 quickly. And hey, John, good to see you. Akila, thanks for the 22 months. Okay, so King F3. Now, uh, my opponent, and by, mind you, this is a classical game. Um, it's not like we're playing a, a bullet game. My opponent's a, a strong GM. So Josh plays the move Bishop F8 in response. And his idea is to potentially swing the bishop to h6. He should have stuck with rook c4, but um, bishop f8 is also a pretty decent move. So how did I follow up here, according to my plan? Well, that uh, um, that bishop on h6 is not a direct threat yet. Because exactly. Because nothing is defended. So do we actually have time to push g4 now is subject to the little bit of a discussion. Um, well, but if you understand that there is a certain ticking time bomb, like, again, I'm abstracting, I'm separating uh, yeah. necessity from yeah. like scientific truth, you know, like, you know that you have to make something happen now. So whether or not g4 actually works in the grand scheme of things is actually not relevant for the game. If you understand what I'm saying here. Yeah, no. Because um, you literally don't have any other time to prepare it. And for the record, I have, I have done this plenty of times. Uh, uh, I have been even known to play Grob uh, as a <laughs> to, to, oh, to generate a reaction. And don't, please don't clip this. <laughs> oh, it's too late, Negro. What okay. have you done? What have you done? And I don't mean to be so, I don't mean to be harsh on this. I, I'm just very adamant about this because I see a lot of players doing this. They spend inordinate amount of time, amounts of time trying to evaluate something when at, nobody cares what the evaluation is. You have to play no. it anyway. No, no. Um, so you you psych yourself out often by realizing that it's it's losing, which this move is in the grand scheme of things. But you have to do it. Yeah. Okay. So that's fine. Yay. H G King G4. Okay. Right. Now Josh finds a very strong move. Rook C3. Okay. And he basically says, you know what, Daniel? You put you put your king on g4, I'm going to make you pay. Because I'm forced to take. Right. And could you tell me what is his idea? What has he cooked up in response to queen takes c3? Okay, good question. Uh, oh, yes. He has this nasty queen yes. e2 check. That's nasty move. That is going to get us mated if we go on f4. Mm -hmm. And if we go back, then he simply gorges on a very important pawn. Thank you, Premium and G for the sub. Yeah. Which pawn? Um, hold on. Which pawn is that? I, I, I lost them. I lost in excitement about this queen e2 move. Uh, he can take on a2, right? So mm -hmm. that's and uh, we. Yeah, are he can in... take on e5, and just kidding. Yeah, he can take on a2. And this is over. I mean, well, this in, is a bullet, over. in a bullet game, Queen E5 would actually oh, be, would very be a, effective. a very effective move, yes. Right. Um, um, and this pawn is just bluff. I mean, look at this. It's protected by the bishop. White is yeah. tied down. The game is over. Yeah. And you can't even go H5 because the queen guards that square. Okay. And obviously, the pawn on C3, if it cannot be taken, uh, presents a bit of a small problem. The fact that it can promote, potentially, <laughs> maybe is also a problem. Okay. Uh, you know, notice that Josh is not deterred by what seems to be the x-ray. This is purely symbolic. I mean, the knight can't move anywhere uh, effective because the rook is undefended. Now, yeah. having looked at this position for about a minute, uh, and this is move 40. I think this was the time control move. Wonderful. What do I do? What do I do? Tough and question. The I'd same say... principle applies. There's only one way to go, and that is forward. Yeah. Uh, you don't have a choice. I mean, you need to. Actually, if you, the only option you have is to play h5. That is the only option. Yeah. Now, absurd? Yes. But actually, the king on h5 is perfectly safe. Taking is actually really, really bad for white. Yeah. No, um, I cannot. In fact, take. I already think white is the one playing for a win here. Yep. Um, and this was fun. I, I would be lying if I said this wasn't fun to play because I knew, okay, probably I'll lose, but at least I'll literally die on my feet. 
All right. I promise not to troll Josh next time he's uh, No, and, and by the way, just for the record, he's I have the highest opinion of him. He's awesome. We've no, been no, friends for a long here. time. Yes. So yeah, no, no. he has uh, been a big supporter. He's a great guy and great supporter of yeah. Chess Twitch and one of me personally in my quest for whatever my chess quest is. So Absolutely. I yeah. second that entirely. And I, yeah. I think it's important to make that clear when, when I'm looking over these games. And sure. sometimes my opponents were not always at their best, but that is never any disrespect sure. meant to the contrary no, with Josh. No, no disagreements here. Okay. So, so C2 five. was played. And he played C2. Yeah, pushing the pawn in. So where does the rook go? Hmm. Okay. Uh, well, there are two logical... I mean, uh, there are basically one logical place, mm -hmm. and it's rook h1. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Now, some people might be attracted by rook g1, but of course, black is not, never not going to take on h5. No, he's not going to cooperate. And the rook no. is just going to sit there. So rook h1. Now, this is where the fact that I play a GM comes in. Josh actually plays very precisely for the next stretch of moves. And we're, we're, we're nearing an absolutely stunning moment, which is part of the reason I'm showing this game. Josh goes rook c8, supporting the pawn on c2. Okay. And essentially, this is the wisdom of, of him putting the bishop on f8. The bishop can come to g7 at a moment's notice and essentially defend and square on h8. Um, okay. So the one thing that I considered here at first, uh, and maybe a lot of people would be attracted to this, was takes and queen h3. But this is just a complete, you know, what do you call this? Like a uh, empty. This is empty threat because black could even just go king f7. And you have and nothing. He, he could actually throw in a check here and then go king f7. White has exactly one check. And the game is, I mean, there's just way too many threats. Yeah. So it's very important also when you're trying to defend a particularly nasty position or you feel like you're losing. There, there is this temptation to just create that one threat, to pose that one trap, but you want to resist the temptation if you're playing against someone halfway decent, because again, they are going to be prepared to deal with that. That's exactly what they're expecting you to do is to set traps. They're not expecting you to play in a level-headed, cold-blooded manner. That is what annoys people the most when you're hard to bring down. Yep. Okay, so instead, I played the move, and this one I'll just say I played the move queen after me. Now, why did I play queen f3? Well, I'm actually posing a threat. And the first move of the threat is to take on g6. And after mg6, what move have I uh, geared yeah, up to play? You're threatening to play... Um, you're threatening to play queen f6. Exactly. And that could potentially be made. Yeah. And the move that I expected Josh to play, and I think a lot of people would play, is bishop to g7, just guarding taking under control that F6 square. This is where the true beauty lies. And I was praying, praying that Josh would make this move. Instead, he found the correct one. Because here's the thing. And it even takes the computer a little bit of time to see. This is already a draw. Wow. And uh, I will tell you the first move of this, um, this combination. Okay. And perhaps you can find uh, and think about the next. And this speaks to a piece of advice that I have, which is when you're losing, it's like you then have license to think outside the box as much as you can. The paradox and the phrase that I like to use is that when you're losing, you have nothing to lose. I know that sounds paradoxical, but you know what I mean. You've already lost. You know, if you lose, nobody's surprised. So you can play as though you have nothing to lose. I actually the know. first move is H6. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, say that again? No, Sorry, no, I didn't mean to. I was you. thinking something along the lines of take on g6 and play king g5, but this makes mm -hmm. more sense. Yeah, the problem there is it's the queen can come back to e8 or the rook yeah. to f8. Yeah, that doesn't fit. And uh, of course, well, bishop has to, well, actually, this next move I'm about to show you loses, but the most uh, seemingly natural is bishop h8 when it looks like that's it. White's attack is fizzled out. Every, the king is perfectly safe. This what is this doing here? The game is over. Black is just going to direct his attention toward promoting the pawn. And this is where thunder strikes out of the blue. Take your time, white supporting. And this is where I encourage everybody in the chat to really focus because this is a cool moment, truly. Yeah, okay. Um, let us let me think for a second and I'm actually going to talk this through. <laughs> for, for and myself. I have some GMs in my chat. I know you guys probably can find this quickly, but don't, <laughs> don't ruin it. <laughs> Oh, thanks, Judah and LC for for a raid of with fourteen. Thank you. 
Uh, all right, so what? how can we mate black here? Uh, we can, I, I'm gonna think. So first move is we kind of wanna do some forcing moves here. So we can play h7. And I'll reasonable just, five. Hmm? Yeah, reasonable start. Yeah, Continue. so king g7, queen f6 takes, we'll collect the rook, we're winning. But that means that black is gonna cooperate. Right, he's gonna play king f8 instead. Yeah, he's gonna not gonna play king g7, he's gonna play h, oh, sorry, I don't wanna make the move, my bad. So h7, king f8, uh, I hate arrows. <laughs> All right. Huh. You know, queen f6 is so darn pretty, but it doesn't work. And why do you say that, my friend? It doesn't work because we take, uh, because uh, black takes with a bishop. And if we take on f6, king escapes to e8, and we don't have a mate. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, yeah, we promote. If we promote. Uh, but then the bishop just takes. Uh, we promote. Oh, actually. But when do you promote? Uh, hold on. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I lost the track. Sorry, I, I, I distracted you. No, 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 no. <laughs> that's fine. Uh, we take back with a bishop, we take with a rook, and we collect the rook here. But are we actually. I mean, we are kind of prevent this pawn from promoting. But is that enough to save us the game? Not really. No. Black has the pawn on c2 and an extra queen. But you are getting fixated on the concept of delivering checkmate. Let us revisit the line. Bishop takes f6, ef6, king e8. What does white do in that position? OK. Uh, hmm. Okay. The white can. So the bish. Okay. So we still have the pawn on h7, right? Right. Um. Okay. So we're uh, calculating h7, king f8, mm -hmm. queen f6, takes takes, king at king e8. White to move. Okay, we can play knight c5 and threaten the mate again. You're still thinking only about mate, but you're forgetting to count the material. What is white's simplest move there? Okay, white has... Uh, white can... Uh, white can you... promote and he's up, yeah. is, is up, is up a piece. Right, that's, that's all there is to it. White promotes oh, and he's up. A okay, piece. I was looking for something too fancy. Fair enough. Exactly, <laughs> and I th that is exactly the catch, and it's a very common problem that everyone suffers from. Yeah, is this over framing? Right, you're trying to look for checkmate. You're telling yourself, "I'm looking for this," but you forget to to think. Well, mate, wait a second. I just I can just like win a piece. I can transform the position favorably. That's actually part of it. So queen f six is a really really nice move. Yeah, bishop f six e f. Now here's the thing. And when I saw this during the game, I was really disappointed at first. Black has a very nasty little check. And here it takes a, quite a bit of skill, uh, not only to stave off the checks, but not to lose. Because if you go king back to g3, it may look like black is out of checks, but to the rescue comes what move? A rook c3. Right, very nice. So where do we go? All right, so we... For the same reason, I presume we can't go to h3, same problem. Right. Um, if we go to f4, queen a4 collects the rook. Right. And basically, everywhere we go on the fourth rank, it black, white collects the rook, which leaves exactly one move, which is king g5. Bingo. Forward we go, forward, forward, forward. But that's not the end of the story either. Well, Black can promote. And the reason he would promote is that he vacates the d2 square for his queen. And what do we do now? And to me, this is actually the nicest part of the combination because of the elegance of escaping the checks. How does white actually escape the checks? What's the next move? I mean, the next move is forced. 
yeah, okay. I was just actually sorry. I was distracting a little bit. I was looking or take or C1, do the give a check on H5 and collect the pawn, but that we have rook C8 mate, so we can right. do that. Okay, so where do we go? Well, we don't have that many moves. Uh, it's literally the question between King G4 and King H4, right? Right. One of these moves is pretty simple to refute. Mm, yeah, Queen H4 doesn't work. Yeah. Check yeah. close King H6 and collect uh, white collects, the black collects the rook. So King G4. Right. Now I have to take on D4. That's my only check. Now notice how cool this is. The knight on C1, which has appeared there, now guards E2. So we have to take here. And now, again, an only move, but this wins the game immediately. White to play. Uh, okay, if we play f4, there are no checks. Correct, f4. Queen f6, and now not only do you promote, but you're going to win the rook as well. And white is winning. Whoa, okay. So, I don't know. I think that's a pretty cool line. <laughs> I was really... Now you see why I was hoping he would go bishop g7. But... I'm playing a GM. Oh so no, he you're, saw pull, this. you're pulling on a Rudolf on me. And Rudolf show me all these fascinating lines, usually behind as, the scenes. And then she says, but that wasn't played in the game. Right. Behind the <laughs> scenes. That's the tragedy of, of GM existence, right? You see all these lines, you pray, 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 and your opponent never goes for them. Josh played a very powerful move, Queen E8. Okay. And the idea is to meet HG with a move F5. And then the queen essentially makes its way to g6 with devastating effect. I will skip a little bit quickly through the next couple of moves because um, essentially I succeeded in putting him to time pressure. These moves all took him a very long time. Now okay. I played queen h3. Um, now, now I am threatening to take him check. Yeah. Another very strong move, bishop h6. It seems to walk right into h takes g6. But in fact, can you remind me what move does black have? And we can promote, right? Well, if we promote, I take. Ah, okay. We don't need to promote yet. We can we can take it takes, on, we can still take on G6 and then we take, cannot because I take cannot. the bishop. All right, so it's the same idea as after HG on the previous move. Josh put this queen on e8. So no, we can reason? play. Yeah, sorry, we can play f. No problem. This is a tough idea to see. I missed it completely, and and the point is, well, this now the king's position backfires, and this is going to be checkmate. <laughs> um, okay. And essentially, uh, Josh. Well, for that reason, I played f4, intercepting the bishop's control over c1. Okay. Josh drops his bishop back to g7 for defensive purposes, and. After h takes g6 came the critical moment. And this is where I have succeeded, again, in creating these chances. And what I have found, and people might take issue with this, is that when you play uh, in this kind of fashion, when you're resilient, when you pose problems, there comes a point when your opponent just starts feeling exhausted. And, and, and you raise the probability that he's going to blunder something. And here, Josh kind of made an automatic move that basically relinquishes his entire advantage. He took back on g6. Now, the winning move, once again, was f5 check. Okay. And the point is, well, this is just crushing for obvious reasons, because king f3, there's rook c3. And let me know if I'm going too fast. No, no, no. I can follow. So white essentially has to defend the pawn. And now, I mean, queen e7 check, yeah. king h5, there's a lot of mates. I'll show you a very elegant sequence. I'll tell you the first move. Bishop takes e5. And now find for me uh, the crusher. King g7. Yes, very nice. No stopping with pitch mate, ladies and yep. gentlemen. Yep. And so that's not the only win because the king is simply stranded here. Uh, you could probably even find a way to sack a queen here, although I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, that is just one of the wins. Um, yeah, probably the computer could generate something even cooler. So that would have been winning, but Josh takes on, on g6, and he simply, I, I think that he, he kind of failed to understand that his pawn on c2 no longer has the support that it requires. And I play the move knight c5 here, uh, continuing to intercept, well, intercepting the rook, right? Yep. I have this tension on the h file, so his bishop is tied to the place of g7, and now my king on g4 is all of a sudden very safe. And uh, he goes king f7, queen f7. I bring the king back to one square to f3, reinforcing the attack on the e6 pawn. 
Yep. Josh goes g5, trying now to attack the king, but it's too late. I literally run away. King e2. That's just kind of funny because queen takes up four. There's queen e6. So he takes with the pawn. Yep. But even visually, even though black is now up two pawns, it's clear that I have developed permanent counterplay against this king. Boom. Finally getting rid of this demon on c2. Exercising the demon. He gives me a check with f3. And I simply get behind the pawn. The king has completed its journey. It is now uh, time to take a vacation uh, under the umbrella of the uh, pawn. And the game ends in a draw as follows. Rook b8, rook b1. I am, well, no, that is not how the game, I am a pawn <laughs> down. <laughs> I am a pawn down, but I've got this beautiful knight. He's got a terrible bishop. Uh, and I was able to, now to deliver perpetual with queen g8 check, check, and we repeated moves. I mean, if he tries any monkey business, only black can be worse here. I mean, I took this draw without even thinking about playing pro, and I was like, I'm not pressing my luck. But something like this is already very dangerous for black. Sure. Um, Even queen so C1 Josh, is, uh, queen C1 is... Yeah, that's like guarantees. It draws in my pocket. So Josh repeated moves. Uh, and if he goes bishop f8, then I have queen c8. And, and because of the pin, I'm going to pick off e6. Yeah. And then... That is how the game ended. Yeah. In, and there you can even exchange on f8 and you're winning. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So... Wow. Um, what are the takeaways <laughs> from this game? This It all started... Compare this final position to King F3, only, you know, like yeah. 15 moves have been made. And the fact of the matter is Josh reacted very well to the move King F3. A, a lot of players, I think, would have just like succumbed to the shock value and they would have either just not taken it seriously and allowed H5 and mate, or they would have fallen into one of the traps that ensues. I feel like when you do this, you get rewarded uh, because you change the course of the game and notice that I'm not going for one cheap trap. I'm going for sustained counterplay, even if it objectively loses faster than, you know, kind of groveling like the computer would. Does that sort of make sense? Uh, not only does it make sense, but all I can say is, wow. I mean, let's put it <laughs> this way. King F3 is... <sighs> it's, yeah, bon clap. Well, it's, it's, it's in vogue to play the bon clap. <laughs> But I want to show you one more example, and it will be okay. uh, significantly simpler, uh, less less uh, aesthetically like pleasing. These. Yeah, well, I do as well. I mean, I think I I really got a kick out of this this game, and it made okay. my tournament. I, I played really well that tournament, and it was by and large because of because I just felt inspired sure. uh, as a result of this game. Um, and um, I want to consider now the other side of the coin, essentially. And okay. if you just give me 15 seconds, I'm just going to pull of up course. this game. Uh, and and I'm, this is another one of my games. I'm not pretending like my games are the best illustrators of these concepts, but it's only because I, I you know, I know which games I think are the most instructive. I um, mean, I can explain my thought process. So that's really the only reason I'm not trying to suggest that um, nobody else can defend. Those people can defend a lot better than I can. Uh, so just wanted to make that clear. Okay, so I have to, it's not in my games database, but I think it's in Let the Let me put it this way, uh, unless, uh, unless Lila is in chat, in either one of our chats, <laughs> I, I will venture to say that you defend much better than anybody present, so. Thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, um, okay, so this was wow. Riga. There it is, I found it, perfect. Okay, so uh, the next game that we're going to see is from 2015. A year later, I played a very nice tournament in Riga, Latvia. Okay. Uh, and the final round, I played a decent tournament. I was facing a very talented player from India, Aryan Chopra. He's now a GM, but he was, he was like, I think, an untitled 2400 back then, so you never want to <laughs> face those guys. Sure. I was white, and I spent three hours preparing a variation that I never usually play, the Moscow variation of the Slav, I wasn't really a D4 player back then. And as uh, Naradinsky usually does, I messed up the like first move of my preparation. I mixed up the move order and got a lost position out of the opening. That sounds quite familiar. Right. And uh, we fast forward to the critical moment, which I'm about to paste. And just give me one moment. I'm gonna decide where exactly I wanna... No be. Okay, so I'm gonna just show you the extent of how lost this position is, and then exactly what I did. Essentially, um, and I'm going to give you fair warning. Uh, it, it's this position is going to be anticlimactic because because it, it's not going to be as nice as the king f3. But 
I'm really trying to illustrate the concept behind this. Uh, so prepare okay. yourself for something that might seem anticlimactic, but bear with me. I think it, it's going to be instructive. Okay, so the following okay. position occurred. Position, and we're going to be facing White's point of view. I was playing White here, and this position occurred on the board. So why is White completely losing? And I mean, it's like plus five. Um, because first of all, Black is up a pawn. But it's not just that. I mean, look at White's king is just really weak. Uh, there is a pin, which Black exploited with a nasty, nasty move that just seems to be an immediate pressure. How does Black exploit this pin in the best possible way? First, think of Black's move here. Okay. Um, F5 is, Bingo. is very natural, right? Yeah. And I mean, look at this. If he takes on E4 with the bishop, there will be hell to pay. Yeah, so, reminds me of some of my positions against Dania. <laughs> <laughs> so... I have to play bishop c2, I mean, yeah. miserable move. And how does he reinforce the pressure? He goes queen d7. You can understand what will happen if he takes on e4 with a pawn and has two connected it's passers. Game, it's game over. Literally game over. So my first inclination here, my first inclination here, th thanks to Smokes for the three bucks, was to play rook f1. But um, I quickly discovered that this move uh, loses to the very strong tactic d3. Yeah. Now, can you tell me what the idea is? What is the follow-up here? Uh, the follow-up is that we take on e4, and after you take with the bishop, we take on d1, and there are, there are multiple pin with and, right and yeah. Whatever you take with the bishop on e4 is lost because yeah. black has two attackers. Essentially, if you take on c6 uh, intermediate move, then of course a rookie one is checked. Black is up a million pieces. Yeah. So um, I saw this, and my first inclination then was to was to do it anyway, and to say, okay, I'm just going to hope that he doesn't see it because d3 is not the easiest thing to find. Then I thought maybe I can go with the other rook, but then I realized he goes rook g4, and uh, this is over. I mean, he's just going to take. I didn't want to just lose like this. Then I remembered um, something that. Uh, Essentially, I think Jonathan Rousen, one of my favorite authors, is a Scottish grandmaster. He talks about this in some of his books. Um, the sort of concept that um, when you're when you're losing, when your position seems hopeless, uh, not only can you generate counterplay against your opponent's king, which is sort of what everybody knows, right? That's how you defend counter. But you can kind of do the opposite. When he is attacking you, you can try to transition the game into something resembling an end game. And this end game might be completely winning for your opponent, but that's not the point. Your opponent is as geared up to checkmate you. He thinks the game is over uh, within a couple of moves. He doesn't want to play a long end game, and he might evaluate that end game unobjectively because he is not prepared to play it. And you can harness that to get out of some incredibly bad situations, and that is exactly what I managed to do here. Now, it's essentially white to move. You have and, you have exactly one move that generates anything resembling a threat, right? which is, and that's. Uh, but I'm trying to figure out is that which move is it? Thank I'm you. Thinking of queen f4. Yeah. Right. So, uh, what tactical solution here? Black does not have to move his rook. Well, what can black do instead? Simply? Black can take on e4. Bingo. And how does this line now? If you take the two six, and really, and that, there's nothing that, to calculate that, that, here. That ends up very ugly very quickly. Yeah, this is very sad. Uh, so I have to take on e4. And what does Black take with? Uh, he can he if he takes with a queen. Well, you still, okay. It's still the same threat, right? Yeah. On, so mate. G two. This is actually mate. Yeah. So. so I have to take the queen. I mean, yeah. I can give a, an empty check on c1. He just moves the hand that doesn't do anything. Yeah. That is indeed what I plan to do. I'll take a good hard look at this position. White has a way of winning one of the pawns. How does he do it? Okay. Uh, well, what, I mean, first of all, this looks totally hopeless, but there is one way White has of picking off one of these passes. Okay, so rookie one uh, and push e3, takes on e3, but careful. But he can play rook g4 and Bingo. we don't have it. So that doesn't work. 
uh, we can do rook f4, and that's mm -hmm. actually more precise. Bingo, rook f4. Yeah. And I had basically pinned my hopes on this move, which I thought, and again, just to, just to make sure people know, rook e1, rook g4 keeps the pawn. Yeah. And rook f4 wins one of these pawns. If you move e3, I go rook takes e4, and king is going to like stop the pawn. Now, here's the thing, and this is going to tell people everything. I knew that this did not come close to defending. If you put Sockfish on this position, evaluation is minus six. Six. And why is it minus six? I saw the reason why Black is so winning, because Black has an idea. The can idea ask, is to go e5. Can I ask a dumb question? Please. Uh, actually, if we go back, um, all right, so um, here Black plays e3 okay i will take e probably let me e i'll take with this rook oh okay yeah that, okay that. Where, where you're gonna say e5 here i was i was hoping that i can play e2 or e5 and then oh you wanted something like this and if you play king f2 i can take on g2 and then I, well i mean even here i could go this way yeah, yeah, that's and if fine. you give me a check yeah it gets a little bit messy okay now what black should do is go e5 and rook e8 now notice this is not possible uh, trying to exploit the pin. Why? Because uh, I mean, we take easy. with the rook. Because we take with the rook, of course. And so uh, Black is up a pawn, but that's not the point. He has a plan. The plan is to simply bring the king to d5, dislodge the rook from e4, and then promote both pawns. Yeah. And it is literally as simple as that. Let's have a look at how that might. And I saw all of this during the game. I was. I, I hate it when people say that um, just to like make someone feel bad, but I literally was going to resign in like two moves here. Now, let's say that white tries to get his king to d3. This might seem like a robust defense, but it's not because, well, after king c3, uh, king c6, king d3, king d5, let's say but white goes rook d2, okay? He bides his time. That is the only thing that can be done. Black plays a very simple move which uh, immediately ends the game. How do you make inroads here using a weakness that White has on the king side because he's pushed one of the pawns? What do you do? Uh, you just play rook g8, right? Yeah, or rook g6, I think, maybe a little bit better. To, to leave this rook just for prophylactic purposes. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. White has to go g4. Rook g3 is a devastating threat. But the move g4 in turn creates another weakness, which Black now exploits how? Same idea. Yeah, we can just uh, double the rooks. Not even the best. I want you to, to, to follow through on the same idea of this logic. Ah, wonderful. Game. Okay, rook f8. You got to be careful. Yeah, I would still go rook f6. Careful with rook f8 because you're leaving this pawn unprotected. So I ah. can try to go here. Fair enough. Guilty still as charged. Still completely winning. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, you are guilty as charged. Yeah. I'm holding you accountable for this terrible move, rook f8. How could you possibly suggest <laughs> that? Um, and rook f3 is unstoppable, after which white is either going to lose a rook or. I'm not going to go any, should, need I go further than this? No. Now, you might be looking at this and saying, well, this is complicated. It's not complicated for someone like my opponent to see, okay? And I saw this very, very quickly. Um, and I knew that this was completely lost, but I went for it anyway in the hopes that he would think that because it's a rook end game, he would roll his eyes at the prospects of a long grind. You know, he would think, ah, oh, man, I was attacking him. Now I have to win this long end game. And... You know, this might sound unrealistic, but that is exactly what he thought. And instead of taking, he goes rook d7. And rook d7 not only is a mistake, but it relinquishes the entire advantage. Because I was able to spot a hidden deficiency in his position. The king on c8 looks safe, but it's weak. It's very weak. And in fact, I can exploit its weakness with what nice move here. All right. Okay. Ah, yes. I. Oh, lovely. Uh, bishop b3. Um, that is the second move, but for, you want to be as flexible as possible. Ah. What you're trying to do is open the c file, right? Okay. But you don't know where you want this bishop. How do you like operate? Yeah, okay. Gotcha. So first, uh, first, like, take the c file. And okay, then decide C1. where you want to put the bishop. Gotcha. Yeah, rook c1 is rook correct. C1. Okay. After bishop b3, he would take on e4. 
and rook c1 has the benefit of obviously oh, that is not yeah, possible yeah, yeah and we are we are short the tempo in the other line yeah I see and that. uh the objective evaluation of this position is now all zeros this is this is uh <laughs> dynamically equal and uh, let me show a couple of moves i mean he goes he, oh obviously it's clear he goes queen b5 to open the square up for the king now i go bishop b3 um as one uh, nicholas version suggested very strong move uh and uh he goes rook g4 queen takes h6 it becomes a total mess the game ended in a draw uh at one point i was even winning um and but i was of course thrilled thrilled to make a draw here in the final round. and um i attributed all to this move queen f4 basically using the concept of transitioning into an end game in order to play psychological tricks in my opponent if that makes sense no no, no. and so that what we've seen here makes sense are then both sides of the coin. On the one hand, generating counterplay against your opponent's king at all costs and realizing that when you're losing, uh, it's okay if your moves don't look pretty. It's okay if you're using your king. You have nothing to lose, um, literally. But on the other side of the coin, if, if you're getting attacked yourself and you feel like checkmate is imminent, rather than setting one cheap trap and hoping your opponent falls into it, uh, such as, you know, such as the move uh, I don't know, rookie one or something, or, you know, hoping for something crazy to happen, you actually go into an end game where you, you, you basically uh, give your opponent this choice of going into an end game, which he has to do, but he goes, doesn't want to do it because he's prepared to attack. I'm not saying this works every time, but hopefully I've laid out basically two specific ways that you can change the course of the game and slowly begin to turn uh, a, a hopeless position back around. Uh, those two are both amazing games. Thank you, Daniel. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Um, what do you say we finish with a short uh, analysis of that fried liver uh, line that we had set out to do? Yeah, let, let's let's do it. Yes. And if you want to look at one more example, that's fine too. But I think it might be a nice nice little balance to let no, these no, no. things sink no, in. No, fried liver works because uh, I ended up losing a game against the Avidits that uh, I mm -hmm. shouldn't have. And uh, I also got crushed by Anna Muzichuk in that fried liver as a white. Uh -huh. so sure. I... So let me paste in an empty sort of a starting position. So yeah. That we can... Then, yeah, okay. So so we're specifically looking at that bishop d3 line. Yes. I understand it. Yeah. Let me show. So the fried liver begins, um, I understand not everybody plays e4, but this is the Italian, knight f6, knight g5. I mean, I'm sure everybody has seen this line before. Yeah. D5, E takes D5, Knight A5, Bishop B5 check, Black Saxophon here for the initiative. And here among the several main moves is the move Bishop to D3. Um, yeah. And let me just pull up my notes here. Yeah, and I'm uh, reasonably, my problem with this line is not that I'm not familiar with the theory. I'm, uh, I prefer to play it as black. Yeah. But as white, the Zen of the position sometimes escapes me. I mm -hmm. know that the theoretical line here is to play knight d5. Right. And then, um, you know. So we're looking at this from White's perspective. Yes, please. OK, got it. Um, so knight d5 is the move, is the main move. Yeah. Uh, it is not the only move. It is closely followed in popularity. Let me see, just so we can lay out. Yeah, bishop b3 is good because it's not as common, but it is very topical. h6 is also played often, but it scores very poorly. Yes. Um, and it's actually, I think, a big mistake because h6 sends the knight where it wants to go, which is where? Uh, which is actually uh, not e4. It's, it's it is e4. e4. That's the whole yeah, point of bishop e4. e3. Yeah. It's to create this, this stronghold for the knight on e4. And uh, now most people think twice and they go knight d5, but h6 essentially becomes a waste of time. Yes. Um, and I think castling here just gives white a big advantage. So the main line goes bishop e7, but but this is, I mean, black is essentially, again, wasted a tempo. And here, uh, the strongest move is prophylaxis against f5. Yeah, and also h5 uh, is weak, it's weakening, so it's hard to push f5 because it, queen h5 is so much stronger. Right, and line. you stop it with yeah. uh, knight g3. And in this position, in terms of the zen, one of the things that white really wants to accomplish, remember, he's up a pawn, not only that, but black's pawn structure is bad. Uh, so it, it, the fact of the matter is black has to convert his initiative into something tangible. The moment you consolidate, 
Um, the, the moment you consolidate, white's advantage is going to be vast. And what consolidating really means in this line is to develop the bishop on c1. So for that to happen, this bishop needs to move. Where should this bishop move on, to d, on d3? In order to keep an eye on preventing f5, there's really a very natural square. It's also why you put the knight on g3 to prepare this move. Yeah, you need to play bishop f5. Mm -hmm. And this is, you know, this is according to the computer. This is plus over minus. I mean, this is very bad for black. Uh, and a lot of people have gone into this, even, even over 2600s have gone into this. Um, one recent yeah. game continued, um, Kornosov against Inar Kiev. Just to show you, like, if people don't know what they're doing, black can be lost in like a couple moves. So Kornosov in Kiev, uh, classical game, 2680, bishop a6. Here we go, d3, in Kiev goes c5, sort of a, out of desperation. And now white overthought things. Uh, had he simply developed, it's already completely winning for white because queen g4 is also coming out. Remember that you can also kind of attack here on the king side. Okay. So we're going to accompany the move h6 with a question mark and say that uh, we're going to make a text comment. Um, this move is a big waste of time since it sends the knight where it wants to go anyway. Um, Black's initiative is very yeah, delicate. Thanks, Hopefully thanks, the text helps you because yeah, when no, you absolutely. copy the file, yeah. And just very delicate, quick, yeah. And just a quick shout out to Nikki who just sent us a raid. Welcome Raiders. I, uh, this is my lesson with Dania. This is uh, a new series on the channel. It's, we're calling it Nicola Prepares. So, oh, and thank you for the subscription. Thank, thank you all for gifting a subscription to Nikki. Welcome Raiders. Perfect. So um, knight d5 then onto the main move. Now, what did you look at here, knight f3? Um, I think I think the the line here is knight f3, and then after knight f4, bishop f1. Right. So actually, after knight f3, the main move is bishop d6. Yeah. So um, again, in this line, I lost two two games, one against Thea and another against uh, Anna. Uh huh. And... So the move knight f4 is again a mistake because again it act it looks good, but it actually helps white liberate. And I didn't mean to interrupt you. Sorry. Uh, what no, were no, you going to say about the games? Yeah, so so this this liberates the pawn on d on d two, and uh, recent grandmaster game continued. There's one important move to know: if e four, white has a very small tactical tactical move, um, exploiting the undefended status of the knight on the fork. Can you spot it? It's not really tactical. Okay, it's like just a okay, good move. Uh, thank you for the follow, the Java two three three. Um, well, we can just uh, you know play d four, right? Uh, yeah, so d3 is actually d3. stronger uh, okay. because it can test the pawn. Let me see. d4, then ah. So the reason you don't go d4 is because actually knight e6 ah. and white has overextended himself. This pawn is very weak. Yeah, I was hoping that we can prevent bishop from coming to c5. Okay. Yeah, and, and one of the topical lines that we should investigate here briefly um, is with, with a computer, and I, I have this open in chess space, is a recent game from the Polish Championship 2019, two grandmasters. Okay. Continued like this. This could be scary for white uh, if you don't know the theory exactly. So this is worthwhile to sort of study completely. And now white has to know the following sequence, which uh, Bartosz Soczko, very strong Polish grandmaster, reproduced. Uh, and the thing is, you take on f3, it looks like you have lost the rook, but the queen can come to the rescue with tempo. Can you spot the maneuver? Uh, yes, we can give a check and then put put one of the pieces on e5. Yeah, and White actually put the wrong piece on e5 in the game. He put the bishop on e5, which is weird, because that allows a very nasty check uh, queen c1. Yeah. So you put the queen on e5, and the point is, if, if now queen takes c2, well, then you simply drop the knight. Queen takes a5. Yeah. And white is actually winning. It's, it's good to know this because this could be definitely scary if you're sort of been blindsided by this. Okay. After bishop b4 check, you simply shift the king to d1. And black, <laughs> yeah, you know, what, what could be more natural than this? And black has to acquiesce now to the trade of the queens, after which the compensation is a non-existent simply developed. It's plus over minus. I have to say this. I, I I was playing the line you showed me last time we had a lesson with uh, Queen D3 in Khan. Mm -hmm. And uh, there I was also played uh, 
King D1 and it was like, uh, what's going on here on the part of the <laughs> opponent. So thank you for that. Of course. Well, I hope that the analysis stood up to it, Ana it, it, uh... it did. I won the game, although I made a couple of blunders, but yes, nice. I, I won the game. Actually, I haven't lost a single game in con since, since you showed me the ropes. Fantastic. And I'm, I w I'm always receptive to, I make mistakes in analysis. So if anybody pokes holes in what we do, please do mention it to me and we'll revisit it. <laughs> Thanks. Um, uh, yeah. I'm always popular. preparing drunk. You have to go, you have to prepare. Yeah, it's it's not popular to admit that you're not perfect, but I'm I belong to that particular minority. Okay, so Bishop D6 is the main move, okay. and we're beginning to sort of um, begin to understand one of the ways that Black should play this position is not to help White get his bishop away from D3. Now the move is castles. Yeah. How did your games now continue with uh, the ones that you lost? Because uh, there's two main moves here, but they're equally spread in popularity. Yeah, the ladies, uh, the ladies played F5. Okay, that is rare. Um, there's only one, and F5 loses on the spot, actually. Uh, then I might be not remembering them properly. But it is a tempting move if you don't see the reason why. The reason why it relates to Black's king. White to play and crush. Find okay, the move. So we can just pl play rook. I, I, I think I misplayed this position. Uh, I think I ended up playing C4, C3 and B4. And then I did, I was, that's okay. one of the reasons we are seeing this. So the, the line here is basically to um, to play rook e1, right? Watch the order. The rook e1 first, they go e4. You need to operate with a, with a far greater sense of urgency. Gotcha, which I didn't, which is why I lost. So you're saying I should take <laughs> queen e5? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. And All then right. rook e1. We'll even look. And, uh, okay. Yep. And no, but this is, I'm not pretending like this is easy to realize why this works. Uh, particularly because uh, there's a very important subtlety here. Queen e7 looks like it defends normally in such positions that four is a move, but here it's not. Now you play queen e2, mm -hmm. which seems to defeat the whole purpose of the pin because, well, hey, bishop f6, and we're chilling, but here there is a, a crucial move, uh, which is which is what? Uh, which is we we can just uh, remove the queen and uh, put where the greater pin we can play huh. and find the best square for the queen always look for the most forcing yep, 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 forceful yep. way to execute your ideas well queen d1 is you know it's what's the let me think for a second we can play we need to defend the rook on e1 right so okay but remember that bishop e6 is an idea to block the the first thing you should be looking for is a check you should always start from the top of the hierarchy. Oh yeah, we can give a check on h5, right? So, the, yeah. yeah, and you can hack you can hack this process by always starting optimistic. You're like, well, what would be the ideal way to move a queen away? Wouldn't it be with check? Yeah. Immediately, your brain supplies this move. If you only think in terms of defending the rook, Fair you're enough. going to get misled. This is very bad because of bishop e6, and black is all of a sudden winning g6, and very importantly, we take the queen of check. Yeah. And we are winning. Um, I mean, for obvious reasons. Uh, so f5 is a mistake. Now, in order to limit the damage, uh, let me just see before we move on to the main lines. Black sh should castle and and basically uh, just say, okay, I made a mistake. Now you drop the knight back to f3. Okay. And, uh, and I well, knight f4 is the best move here, but we'll look at knight f4 in the main move order. And what you do after knight f4 here is the same as what you do there. Uh, so it doesn't make sense to look at this uh, specifically. So let's begin with the move uh, castles, and then we're going to look at knight of four last. Okay, okay. so castles uh, in this position. Are you familiar? Has this move also been featured in your practice? No. Okay, but it makes sense to look at them, I think, because they're the two main moves by far. Yep. All other moves are extremely unpopular. Okay. Here, it, the best move, according to my notes, is... Uh, to drop the bishop back to e2. Um, and okay. I'm going to insert a comment here. Uh, this move should be understandable if you are aware of the main idea of the line, which is what? What is white aiming to do? How is white aiming to consolidate? OK, so white basically needs to develop its pieces. So you need to start bringing the knight in so we can start by playing d3 which also prevents knight from coming to f4 and then 
put knight on c3 and so on and so forth. Yeah. And the main thing is to push that deep on. Yeah. Um, preparing the development of the pieces. And does it make sense that if, if you finish your development, then you're going to be in fantastic shape? So uh, obviously, Black has to say something about that. And he's going to go e4. Okay, he has to. If he doesn't go e4, he is much worse. Now, the good thing is bishop e2 is almost a novelty. So your opponent is not going to know how to respond to this. Um, and so this is some home, home cooking. And you go 91. Yeah. Now, I know this looks terrible, but uh, you have to understand that if you go d3, you're going to uncoil. Yeah. And once you uncoil, you're going to be up a pawn for no compensation. So black has to play with tremendous precision in order to avoid getting a bad position. To me, the human move is queen h4. I feel like that is the move. Well, I feel like that is the move most people would play. Uh, and if you don't like bishop b2, we can take a look at the main line. So just for context, um, if you feel like this is a little bit over the top, I would be happy to show you what no, no, no. you want, which is... Uh, uh... Truth be told, um, I had a saving variation uh, in a game against Anna that I needed to play knight e1, so that made perfect sense. Not, right. not here, but later. Yeah. So this is the line I think most people go into thinking that they're winning. Well, Black is not winning. <laughs> Black is very far from winning. Because, um, well, this is a very, very sharp line. Um, it, it's crazy complications, actually amazing complications. But black has to know everything here because you go knight g2 and you continue to bring pieces into the game. You're preparing d3. And uh, let's say, for example, that black goes bishop f5. Well, guess what? After d3, it's already plus minus. I mean, white is already winning. Yeah. And winning, literally, because black is, um, well, there's a Russian expression black is at a broken gate, literally. You know, bl black <laughs> is at the gates and the gates are closed. Um, okay. I don't know how to translate that. Uh, maybe I wonder if there's an equivalent expression in Serbian. Uh, yeah, it would be knocking at the closed door. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Same, same uh, meaning. I like how that happens. And after rook f8, for example, uh, knight c3, as you said. Yeah. And you can see how black's initiative begins to fizzle out. E, D, C, D. And uh, white is in, is in very good shape here. It's just like knight e3 comes in. Bishop f3, and you've begun to consolidate. Yeah, and the so, extra pawn is going to tell, and the knight on a5 is going to stay stranded there forever. Right. So essentially, queen h4, I think, is a mistake, and queen c7 is the best move. Thank you, give me shelter. So we won't bog ourselves down too much. We'll just show you a couple moves here. You go g3, uh, and if bishop h3, again, you bring the knight, you free and the knight, which is not always a good idea. <laughs> But here, I mean, you're, yeah. you're aiming to play d3. And I think that, practically speaking, it's very hard for Black uh, to find a sequence of accurate moves that gives him enough compensation. Because essentially, you pre-move d3, for example, rook a d8 d3, and if Black takes on d3, you play bishop takes d3, now you're threatening queen h5. Okay. So essentially, uh, we can continue the analysis um, perhaps next time. Uh, but I think this is enough no. for now in this line. Uh, let's look at knight f4. Uh, I don't want to bog you down. So perhaps once you review this, uh, we can we no, can go a little fine. bit deeper. No, this is already huge, huge advantageous. Yeah, and I mean, the fact of the matter is bishop b2 out of 200 games has been played twice. So nobody's going to know that move. Knight f4 is, uh, by four games, the most popular move. You go rookie one uh, or knight c3. I think the lines transpose into each other. Knight c3 might even be more... Uh, more precise. Um, now let me see. Let me just check something. Actually, no, they do not transpose into each other. Let me just check what I've written. Thanks, Daniel. Okay. This is the equalize. I think this is Black's best line because this line actually might equalize. Um, yeah, knight c3. The idea is simply to take on d3, cripple White's pawn structure, and claim that that pawn structure gives Black enough compensation. And a You're going recent... to laugh, and I'm sorry to be rude and interrupt, mm -hmm. but that actually all. won a game against Grandmaster Gowry in, in, in a simul, Dang. playing as black. That's pretty cool. Yeah, no, this is a, yeah, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> <laughs> I am going to laugh. Yeah. Terrible. No, 
So Gary is actually playing right now. In, in yeah, I know. Show. I know. I'm, I'm really hoping that he is going to... He actually has four norms. He just needs some rating. Yeah, speaking of which, I'm just going to check the positions really quickly on my phone. Please do. Uh, it's a it's a big tournament. You know, Hans is and he is, shooting he's for his playing last. Hans and Hans is uh, Hans is the class of that tournament. So yeah, Hans actually you beat oh, Hans Vigari. <laughs> okay, Hans Vigari just now. Um, right. So Hans is doing very well. Okay, anyways, um, so let's see here. B three is a recent attempt by Levon Aronian against Dingley Ren, which I quite like. If Levon Aronian played something recently, that means we could probably repeat it. And we're just going to look at how the game continued. Ding goes c5 to stop d4, institute the bind. Levon goes bishop a3, and he got an advantage quickly, basically attacking the pawn. Ding goes bishop a6, and Levon goes rook e1, counter attacking e5. Ding defends. And here Levon goes uh, knight e4. Or actually, no, Ding did not go rook e8. I think rook e8 probably should have been preferred. Oh, no, no, sorry. Aronian did not go uh, rook e1. That's the thing. Um, and uh, rook e1 should have been preferred. After rook e8, 94, I think white is slightly better because he's piling up on that c5 pawn. And uh, this has been reached by transposition in various correspondence games. I think white is just a tiny bit better. Right? And it's pretty much risk-free. Sorry, whoops. Pretty much risk-free. So this recent attempt by Aronian b3, uh, just developing the bishop. Uh, previously, people had gone rook e1. Gotcha, instead of b3. Yeah. So let me just say, after simply, pre whoops. simply preparing to develop the bishop. Um, Thank okay. you. Yep. And I presume the idea behind c5 is not only to protect on d5, but to kind of not force that poor knight on b7. Right. And let's just say if, if black goes bishop a6 instead of c5, which I think is a very natural move, then you'll see why c5 is chosen. Rookie one, rookie eight, and now white has d4. Yeah. And in the ensuing complications, uh, of which there really are none, it's important to take here first so that there's no x-ray against the knight. Yeah. And one line I analyze is bishop takes h2 check. Um, which is an understandable tactic. What is the idea after king takes h2? The idea is to give a check on e5 and call To give a check on e5. Call the yeah. knight on d4. Yeah. And now after bishop e2, it turns out that white is just better because he's got this huge x-ray going. Yeah. And um, black, is in, black is in trouble. His pieces are stranded on the side. It's actually plus over minus here. So yeah. these lines uh, require very much filigree knowledge from black. And f5, you know how to punish now. So I think that this yeah. gives you uh, yeah. probably enough material to review for now, and I'm happy to delve deeper next time into uh, those subtleties. No, no, that, this is this is perfect. This would have, well, it wouldn't have won me the game against Anna Muzichuk, but I would have <laughs> been able to defend better and not get crushed in 22 moves the way I was. So thanks, Tanya. My my pleasure, Nicola. This was awesome. Yeah. I think it would be a good good time to uh, to pause pause this session. Thank you. Uh, but I think it was a productive one. You know, we talked about I the defensive it. methods. Um, you're easy, easy to teach. I, it's a pleasure, Nikolai. I, I uh, really, you make it easy for me. So uh, thank it's, you, Daniel. It's respect awesome is that we respect is mutual, and I have to say this: I'm not the only. I'm not the only person who started winning games in particular lines after you showed. I mean, if I remember, Charlie had the same experience. <laughs> And it's, it's not like he had a short game, didn't? <laughs> yeah, no, same happened to me. I honestly have at least won at least five games in the kind of variation you showed me last time. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. Of and, course, of yeah. course, it's my pleasure, Nikolai, and I'm thank so you, happy sir. that we uh, continue this tradition. Thank you. I'm going to raise my coffee cup to more to more of these production productive and sessions. Me too. Thank you, Daniel. All right, cheers, cheers. Uh, you're going to continue to stream. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll go for for another solid 30, 45 minutes. Okay, I'll then uh, send you the raid. Thank, thank you, you guys. so much, Nicola. And I will be enjoy. And my next stream is going to be the match against Jesse February, Sunday at noon. I have managed to uh, persuade myself to uh, try to adopt her. I think that's, <laughs> that's a very lost cause. But uh, I want to see how it looks on the other side of the fence. Absolutely. Well, good luck to you, Nicola. I'll Thank be you. cheering you on in another great session. I'll talk to you soon.
Thanks, Thanks Daniel. Man. And All thank right. you Have guys. A great evening. Thank you for joining us. Thank you Bye. for the raids. And I am sending the raid over. All right. Okay.